So, uh, tonight we are talking about classes and modules. Classes are the next step in our journey of reusability. We started with reusability when we got into loops and we reused the same block of code again and again and again. And then we went to functions and we were able to encapsulate our code into something that was named, which was the function definition. And now we're going to expand that to classes. And what classes do is they allow us to group not just code, but code and data together. And we can group a lot of different kinds of code. We can have lots of different functions inside of a class. Um, and there are some specific syntax as usual and um, some specific nomenclatures. The concept of classes is really based on object-oriented methodology. And it's about encapsulation. You take, you take like data and like functions and you name them. You give them something that's a name. And that named thing can be reused again and again and again. And a class is a definition of a thing. It's not a thing itself. It's the difference between a blueprint for a house and living in a house. The class is the blueprint. The house is the thing. Um, they've got a couple of different uh, examples here, which I'm not really thrilled about. Um, so we're just going to go down to grouping data. Come on. So what are the constructs for a class? What is the syntax? Well, the first thing is the keyword class. The word class in Python is a keyword. It can only be used to define a class. It will always be left justified. And what comes immediately after that is the name of the class. Immediately after the name of the class is our friend the colon, which everybody inevitably forgets at one point in time in their programming career. And then we have what they're calling here our statements. So we're going to have functions. We're going to have variables. We're going to have all kinds of interesting things because you can overload stuff, which we'll get to in a bit. Here they call it. The object maintains a set of attributes, OK? And those attributes are functions and values. The next thing to know is how, when you create a class, because a class doesn't exist in Python except as a definition. It is not something you can act on. You have to create an object from a class to be able to use the stuff that we've packed into that class. The first thing you have to do when you're defining an object, when you're using a class to create an object, is you have to do what they call a constructor. And the constructor is a method. This is the method. Def, because it's a method. Underscore, underscore, init, underscore, underscore. Very specific. It has to have two underscores, the word, and two underscores. And then open parenthesis, self close parenthesis, and the colon. This is a constructor. And this will be used each time the class is created. And I'm going to show you an example in just a minute. And inside our class time, we have hours and minutes. Now you'll notice this word self. This is the first time we've encountered this word. Self is in fact a keyword in Python. And what it does is it identifies the object that you're coming from. Because I can have lots of time. I can have lots of objects created for time. I can have a time for New York. I can have a time for Japan. I can have a time for London. So I can have objects of time that each have a different hour and a different minute 
because they're someplace else in the world. So how does Python know which one I'm talking about? Well, from within the class, it uses this self. The self actually sends the pointer to the, the object that you've created from it. And I hope I'm not getting to, um, let's go to an example. It's probably the best thing to do right now. So I am going to just start with, we'll do the truck because it's, um, it's relatively simple. So what we have here is we have the keyword class. I know that's a keyword, it's always left justified. Then I have the word toy. Toy is the name of my class. So I'm going to be creating toys with this class. I have my colon and then I'm starting by defining the constructor. So this is the constructor and I have my word self. If you're going to have a class that uses the object information, you have to have self. I'm going to take an argument for name, an argument for price, and an argument for minimum age. So these arguments are just like you would pass in information to a function. You're passing information into a class through the constructor. So that's what the constructor is there for. It is there for you to say, I've got some data that I want you to store for this particular object, and then when I go to use it, it's going to be used for that particular object. And here I have self.name is name. So basically I'm creating a variable in the object called name and I'm setting it equal to the argument that I've passed in called name. Now this could be something different. This didn't have to be name. That's just a word. This is name is this name, but this name doesn't have to be this name. So self.name is whatever the value for the argument name is. Self.price is whatever the argument value in the argument price is. Self.minage, same thing, whatever the value in minage is. And down here I've got this Devster, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, it allows us to do some fancy stuff that makes, that, that makes things easier. So up until line 9, line 9 is the end of my class definition. Nothing else is in the class because the next line of code is less justified. So Python comes down here and it says, okay, class is ended. Because what you will notice is everything that is in the class is indented under that class. So it's just like if you've got an if statement and you've got a block of code under that if statement, you've indented it. Same indentation rules apply for classes. Nothing different. If you've got a method, you're always going to indent under that method. So same indentation rules apply. So now, line 12, I have, I've got a variable named truck. I know it's a variable. It's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. Now I'm using toy, okay? So what is it telling me with toy? Um, actually, let me just get rid of some of those. Oh, that didn't do it. Um, I'm using toy. This toy on line 13 is this toy on line 1, okay? And I'm passing three arguments. I'm passing monster truck XX. I'm passing 14.99, and I'm passing 5. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to print truck. Now that's where this little stir comes in because what I'm doing is with this function I am telling Python that if anything needs a toy as a string, this is how to create that string. I'm going to print truck and I'm going to create a doll. Same toy. Okay? But instead, I'm creating a toy called Chatty Cathy. She's $12.99. And four is the minimum age. And then I'm going to print doll. 
So let's take a look at what's going on here. And I'm putting two breakpoints in for a reason, because this is not actionable code until I get to line 13. Python, you're not going to see Python walking through these independently. Okay, it's just a definition. From line one through line nine is just a definition. Python's going to read it in and do absolutely nothing with it until I call the constructor for the first time. So let's change that to truck. And let us debug. Okay. So, oh, my bad. It's reading those in. Sorry, it read those in. That's why it stopped there. It didn't actually do anything yet. So I lied a little bit. It goes into it goes into the thing and it reads in the different elements and that's what it was doing. But it wasn't actually changing anything. There were no variables to change. So line 13, I'm on line 13. I have truck equal toy. Well, what's going to happen here? Well, what's going to happen here is I am going to step in to the constructor for toy. That's what happened right here. I went from line 13 up into the constructor, and, and I know it has to be the constructor because that's how you call, that's how you construct an object. You call the name of the class plus any arguments you're going to send. And so now I'm going to set these variables, these attributes in the class to name, price, and min age. So we're going to set name, price, actually let's go to the debugger. So I have this self object and I've just set name and price and min age. Okay. If I go here and I step over one more, I have a truck. I have a toy, it's truck, and I have a min age, a, uh, a name, and a price. Now, if I print it, now this is the interesting thing, and we'll find out a little bit more about this in a minute. If I step into this print, well, what I'm going to end up doing is going right here because I am telling Python if somebody has a, has a, has a, object of class toy, you can use this to create the string. And so that's what it will do. It's going to create the string. It's just this particular formatted string, and it's going to return it to print. And when I step over, you'll see here, Monster Truck XX costs only $14.99, not for children under five. So. That's what I just did because I had that class. So now we're going to do the same thing again, except this time we're defining a doll. The doll is called Chatty Cathy. She costs $12.99, not for children under the age of four. So let's do this again. We're going to step into toy. It takes us to the constructor. I'm going to set all my variables, and then I'm going to print doll. Before I do that, I want to show you that there are now two instances of a toy. There's one called doll, and there's one called truck, uh, all from the same class. I get all that structure and all that information because I created a class called toy. So I have two objects. I have an object called truck and an object called doll. The object called truck and the object called doll are of type toy because they were created from the class toy. So the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to step over and we're going to see that Chatty Cathy costs only $12.99 and not for children under four. So what Python did is it created two objects of a given class and then I can use those objects I can use the difference, the, the, the difference in the fact that, you know, Toy has a name Monster Truck and Chatty Cathy has, sorry, and Toy, sorry, Truck has a name Monster Truck. 
Dahl has a name, Chatty Cathy, and I can use those differences because of this self, because Python is being told, here's the object, now use the data from that object. Okay, let's go back. Um, so we were just talking about multiple instances of a class. That's what we just showed you. I do have a time class. We're, I'm going to use it in a little bit later in the lecture because we're going to talk about overloading operators. And I have lots of overloaded operators. By the way, stop me if you guys have any questions because I know this can be a little bit uh, challenging. That's not the one. OK. So at a two one instance methods. So instance methods are methods that are defined on a class and that are called when you have an object. So there are instance methods and there are static methods. An object is an instance of a class. So that is why they are called instance methods. So, and this is where an instance method always has self as the first argument. It just does. That's the way you have to define it. So, um, and it is always an instance. This print time is an instance. You can tell an instance because it has self, which means the pointer to the object, because the object is what stores the information is being provided to this function. So it can work off the information that's within the object. So that's what self does. It, it gives it the ability to know what object is, um, is being used, because that's what actually holds the data. Um, accidentally forgetting the self parameter of a method generates an error. And it will, and it's um, not going to be very, very handy for you that the message doesn't say a lot other than, you know, it takes zero pos positional arguments but was given one. It doesn't say, hey, wait a minute, you need to put self here. So if you get an issue where you're, you're in a class, you're looking at an instance method and you get something about positional arguments, first check to see whether or not there's a self. And again, it's something that every programmer has done when they're prog programming object oriented. They have at one point in time forgotten something. Um, so they're talking here about um, a class acts as a factory that creates instance objects. I like to think of it as a class is a blueprint for an object. An object is the real thing. A class is the definition of the thing. So like with time, again, you can have time in New York. You can have time in Japan. You can have time in London. And those will be three different times. But they all have the same properties. They all have hours and they all have minutes. Um, let's see. Stop me if I'm going too fast, by the way. So here's their example of a seat reservation system. And um, basically, you have a, a seat. You're going to reserve a seat. You're going to make the seat empty. You're going to check if it's empty. So these are all the things that you can do, and you can do a lot of this. And the nice thing about a class is you can take every single method that is going to be acted upon in that, for that particular thing and put it in one place. You don't ever have to worry about it again because it's in the class, and you get it when you create the class. So if I'm uh, making an airline reservation, Somewhere in that reservation system, 
some piece of software has to say that a seat is available or not and allow you to reserve a seat or not. If you've ever been on an airline site and you're cho choosing your seat on that little picture, somewhere behind it is a class that's associated with a seat, with that seat. And there is one object for one seat object for every seat in that plane. Um, and so this just provides a more comprehensive set example. So you can have a lot of different seats. So you have a, um, in this case, we're just taking and it's making an empty seat. That's what it's doing. And then you can print the seats. You can see what available seats are and you can let someone reserve a seat. Constructors. Constructors often, I find, um, confuse people who are new to object-oriented programming. And the constructor is just a place for the programming language to start. When you're creating an object, it's got to know, it's got to start someplace. And so every object has a constructor. Now, in some languages, you don't actually have to explicitly create the instructor, constructor. Um, in some languages, you do. Um, it is my general rule to always have a constructor um, because then at least you have control of the start. Now, not everybody believes that. That's flavor versus function. You do what you feel comfortable about. The important thing is that you understand that a constructor is the place where you start when you're creating the object. And the constructor is nice because that's where you can start to load in your data for that object. So it could be the name of the toy, it could be the price of the toy, it could be the hours and minutes for time, it could be the seat number for a reservation. So whatever that is, you're basically loading in data for most um, object creation, but the, the init is that's what it's doing. It's initializing. It is the place to start. Um, okay, it's that one. I think. Um, eight six one. So I I did up eight six one just so we could go over it, and this basically has. Um, a phone plan, all right? And it's really talking about a constructor with parameters. Um, and it has number of minutes, number of messages. Um, they should default to zero. And you can have sample output. So this says phone plan, fix me, def print plan. So basically, you need to add a constructor. So when we're looking at this, this is what we have to do. When they're talking about that in Zybooks, they're talking about, hey, I, I think you should be able to create a class with the number of minutes and the number of messages, and they should default to zero. Well, we know how to default to zero in a function because we learned that when we were doing functions. The same thing happens here with classes. You can default the argument. And again, this is, whoops, this is the constructor. It's the place to start. And in case nobody um, sends in the number of minutes and the number of messages, it's always just going to default to zero. So that's what I want. When they say fix me, add a constructor, what they're talking about is adding the init method. Interfaces. Um, an interface, honestly, is something I don't use that much in Python. I use it all the time in Java, but I don't use it that much um, in Python. And the, a class interface just consists of the method that the programmer is going to call um, to access anything in the class. And it's valuable in languages like Java because you have to have that to 
simulate multiple inheritance. I've never found it that useful in Python. Um, but basically that's all it is. An interface is just the method definitions. Um, okay. It's class customization. I do find this very useful. Um, so what we saw before was the underscore, underscore, stir, underscore, underscore. And that's a customization. Basically what it allows me to do is it allows me to say, hey, Python, if you have something of type toy, what I would like you to do when I want to use it as a string is call this method. So I don't have to have all of this code every time I want to print out a toy. All I have to do is to find this string and then use it just like a string. Because normally what you would get if we didn't have that, let's look at the difference in toy. So I'm going to go back to truck and I'm going to comment this out. I'm going to just, and we'll see the difference real quick. Oops, let's get my things right. So I'm just going to run this, okay? Now, this doesn't look anything like what I just had there, okay? I've got this thing that says basically this is a toy object and here's its address and memory right there. That's what it's telling me. But it certainly doesn't give me any information about the toy. Now, the only thing I changed was to comment out these three lines of code. If I uncomment them, I have a custom string function, and if I run it again, I get Monster Truck XX costs only $14.99 and Chatty Cathy costs only $12.99. Because I have customized this class, so every time Python needs to use a toy as a string, it's always going to call this. That's a class customization, and there are more that we can do. Um, so here they're talking about overloading operators. So we have operators like less than and equal than in Python. Um, and you can overload them with classes. I can overload the equal sign. I can overload the less than sign. What does that mean? Overloading basically says, Python, if I have two objects and a less than sign in between those two objects, go use this method. Don't actually try and make it a normal less than because a less than or an equal sign or a, the double equal sign or greater than, anything like that, up till now we have always had to assume that they were integers or floats. That's it. Those are the only thing you could use with an equality operator or less than or greater than with integers and floats. Pretty much it. Now we get to define what those operators do. And it, it's very powerful and very helpful. So in this case, I have a class called time. Whoops, sorry. I have a class called time. That class has hours and minutes, I'm going to create time with different hours and minutes. I have a stir overloader customization. So I, when I want to use it as a string, it's going to print out hours and minutes. And I have this underscore, underscore, LT, underscore, underscore. There's a pattern here. That underscore, underscore with something in between it, underscore, underscore, is a special nomenclature and it is used for class customizations. So this is basically saying, hey, Python, if I have class, if I have two objects that are of class time and I put a less than in between them, use this function to figure out what's really less than and greater than. So we're just going to put a breakpoint there and we'll just go look at the code. So num times is three, I'm going to create a list called times, I'm going to load up the list, that's all I'm doing right there, is the user is inputting hours and minutes 
um, and I'm appending here. Here I am appending the time to the times list, so I can store objects inside of a collection, a list or a dictionary. And then I'm going to do, and I'm going to say, um, I'm going to say min time is times of zero, and then I'm going to say for t, it's just a variable, in times, if t is less than min time, then min time equals t. So I'm basically doing what the earliest time is. So if we run this, um, I'm going to stop there. Okie dokie. All right, so we're going to go to time. And I am going to debug this. So I'm going to say 10, 10, 11, 11, and 12, 12. So I have a times list right here. And it has three times in it. It has 0, 1, and 2. Three different time objects that are that live in this list. And so now I want to see what happens. So I want to find the minimum time. So I am going to step over min time is just gonna it's gonna start at one. I'm going to now I have for T in times 10 10 if 10, 10 is less than the current minimum time that I'm going to send the current minimum time to T. So we're going to step over, and lo and behold, that less than sign takes me into the class. So I'm now in the time class. So the time class can determine is 10, 10 less than, equal to, greater than 10, 10, or is it just not less than? So it's probably really what's going to happen. So I'm going to say if self.hours is less than other hours, because we're an instance, we have the concept of self, and it knows that the object self is 1010, and the other is what else was passed in. Now, in this case, it happens to be the same object. So self dot hours is less than hours and other dot hours now i can use this less than here because i'm actually can i'm actually comparing two integers so this is the arithmetic less than not the time class less than so now i'm going to compare minutes and it's not going to be there so i'm going to go false so now i have 11, 11 is my, uh, is the time I'm comparing. Going to go right back in. Self is now 11, 11. Not 10, 10 anymore because I'm on the 11, 11 um, object. And the other object is 10, 10. It's the first one. So I'm going to step over. I'm going to step over. I return false. I'm going to go up to the top of the loop. I'm now at 1212. 12. We know it's going to happen. I'm going to go into the overloaded operator for less than. It's going to check. The, the hours are not less than hours, and the minutes um, are not, sorry, self that hours is not equal to other that hours. I return false, and I know what the minimum is. And now I'm going to print min time, and I'm going to step over, and guess what? We go into the overloaded string. So the class has taken care of a whole lot of stuff for me. And you can do this with any of the operators. You can do it with less than, greater than, equal to, less than or greater than. These are all the operators that you can overload. And if you're going to be doing comparisons between objects, 
my suggestion is always overload them. It is so much easier on you than to have some function someplace else. Just allow the class to take care of its own. Um, so this is just 8.9. So we have, how are we doing on time? We're doing okay. So here is the pseudocode for 8.9. So, oh, and I apologize. I'll fix this. I don't have my indentation right here. Um, this, this needs to be indented to the left right here. My bad. Um, so what I have is I have, I'm defining a class called car. There's a model, a price, and it, it, there's a, mo a model year, a purchase price, and a current value for the car. Those are the three things the constructor is going to take in. And then I'm going to define a function to calculate the value. Um, so I'm going to, there's a deprecation rate. Um, there's the... You have a deprecation rate, you have the age of the car, you calculate the value of the car based on the deprecation rate, and you set the current value of the car. And then we have that we're going to define a function to print the car information. So that's that underscore, underscore, stir, underscore, underscore. And that's the end of the class. Like I said, I'm going to fix this because this def needs to be one to the left. So before I put this up, I'll fix it. But basically, I've created a main function. The user is going to input three pieces of information. I'm going to create a car object. I'm going to set the model year and the purchase price. I'm going to calculate the current value of the car object, and I'm going to call the function to print it. So that's what 8.9 does. And like I said, I'll fix this before, um, before I put it up on YouTube with the other links. Winning team. Let's see. That should be the other one. Okay, 8.10. At least this one is indented properly. I have a class team. I have to define a constructor. Um, let's go read the statement. Team, okay, complete the team class implementation. For instance, method get win percentage. For the instance get win percentage, the formula is win teams divided by win teams plus team losses. So basically what you're going to do, and it's nice because they give you most of the code. What they want you to do is they want you to find a function called get win percentage and get it to work. So the get win percentage is just going to... You, the real issue with get win percentage is you have to remember the self. So remember the self. And then you do the calculation and you return the number of team wins. And here you're going to have a main function. You're going to create a team object. You're going to input some information. You're going to um, set the name of the team object, the wins. So set the win percentage. You call get win percentage on the class. And um, if the win percentage is greater or equal to 5, then you output congratulations. Otherwise, you output the team name. So that's all you have to do. And I think I glossed over something that I shouldn't have glossed over. Give me just a second. Class interfaces, constructors, seat reservation. It is how to call a function on a method on the class. And the way you do that is you use a dot notation. So you have an object. Let's see, I should have one. You have, okay, that's not the right one. Let me, okay, here we go. So how do I call an instance method not an overloaded, but an instance method on a class. You do that using the dot notation. So I have an object named square. 
sorry, a class name square. I'm going to create an object of type rectangle. And if I want to know what the area of the rectangle is, I simply say object dot and the name of the function. And if I have to pass parameters, I pass parameters to it. So it's not very different than, um, I'm trying to think of an example we've had. Um, and I'm drawing a blank, so I apologize. But that's the notation. So it's the name of the object and then the name of the class and if you pass in anything. Now notice I have self here, but I'm not passing in anything here and that's because self is implied. You never have to pass in self for an instance method. So this is so the dot notation is how you call an instance method when it's not an overloaded function. So let's keep going. Okay, because we're going to get down and talk a little bit about modules. Modules are nice. Uh, modules. So module is a library of code. It's a collection of code that somebody else has created and hopefully tested. And um, it they're wonderful. You can find modules for just about anything. Um, for good object-oriented code, it is always a good idea to segment your code for your given requirements and functionality. Now, I can't give you an exact definition of what your requirements and your functionality are because it changes, but you really want to group things together. And the way I do things is I group like things together and I put them in a module. And then that module is a named library of code that you can use, okay? Python has all kinds of modules. It has a regular expression module. It has a file module. It has an operating system module. It has a regular, it has, I think I said already, a regular expression module. So there's a math module. There's all kinds of modules that Python has that allows you to not have to reinvent the wheel. You don't have to know how to do a square root. Python has a math module that can do the square root for you. Somebody else has already programmed it. All you do is call out and get the, um, the return value back. And it's, this, is, this is how you become more efficient as a coder. Okay? I'm not going to reinvent, my, reinvent the wheel every time I'm coding. I'm going to try my very best to write efficient code. Part of that is understanding that I may not be the person who writes all the code. I may be using standard modules. I may be using standard libraries. I may be using modules created by a coworker. A coworker may be using modules created by me. It's part of being efficient in what you do is to understand how to encapsulate your code. First level of encapsulation that we dealt with tonight are objects and classes. The second level of encapsulation is a module. And a module is a complete script. So it's not, it's syntactically correct. You should have been able to write test code for it. It's just packaged in a library that can be called later on. And what Python does with a module is when you import, here's, here, here's what you do. You import a module. So import is a keyword. The next thing is the module name. What that does, what Python actually does, is it goes out and it reads that whole module in. So don't import things you don't need. And it makes it available to the script at runtime. So when Python starts up, when it, the, the interpreter is going, it's going to go out and it's going to grab that module and it's going to use what it needs to from that module. Um, and it's it's just very handy. So that's just finding modules. There are all kinds of built-in modules. Okay, Python just has all kinds of modules. There's also GitHub and there's also Google. 
and you can find modules in so many places. Python has this huge open source community and they they are they're always creating something new and interesting. You can create a Python game in Pygame. Okay? There are things for astronomy. There are um, all kinds of modules out there for just about anything you would want. Um, yes, yeah, so one thing to note is that the Python modules need to be someplace where your interpreter knows about them. PyCharm is very good because you can set it up and say here. In fact, I'll show you. Um, so let's see. If I go, okay, if I go to the interpreter, uh, where is it? Sorry. Um, the interpreter on PyCharm actually allows you to install modules and it puts them in a place where you can find them. I'm just trying to figure out where that is in PyCharm. Is it in the environment? Okay, so site packages. So here are all, we'll just use this as an example. Here are all the site packages associated that PyCharm has with it. I have a YAML package, I have a URL lib, and I actually think I installed YAML and URL lib um, because of programming I was doing and PyYAML. So these are just modules that I have imported. So if I look at PyYAML, I have a license, I have, inf I have, you know, all of this information associated with PyYAML. The most important thing is that I get, and, and for YAML, I get all of this code. When I import YAML error or events or loader or nodes, I get all of this code because I have installed and I've made available to my running program a module. So when I wanted to use a YAML file, I didn't have to learn how to parse a YAML file. I didn't have to write all of that code. If you have an XML file, you don't have to worry about writing the code to parse the XML. There is There are modules out there that will do that for you. So that's the importance of a module. That's the importance of understanding how and what to import. Yes, self dot something. Um, okay, I completely lost context on that one, Casey. Sorry. So, importing specific names from a module. Sometimes you don't want to import the whole module. You want to import only a portion of the module. So you have this nomenclature. It says from the module name, import an address. So I don't have to import all of YAML. I can import, I can import YAML.errors, which I probably won't, wouldn't do. But it basically just reduces the amount of code that you're bringing into the running Python because every line of code increases the amount of memory space associated with a running program. Python is no different. So that this 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 is a way to reduce that amount of code. Because if you're running a very large package, I mean, think if you're running Pinterest, because Pinterest is written a lot of Pinterest and Netflix are written in Python. Um, you don't want to import anything that you don't need to because it's just going to increase the, the memory space that your program is using. Executing modules is scripts. Um, okay, so 
Um, basically, they're just saying that anything that is in the global space of the module will be executed the minute the module is imported. And if you have a module like that, I would um, I would be wary of using it. There shouldn't be a lot of stuff in the global space. When you import a module, unless you're importing it specifically so that it runs something, um, be a little wary of importing that module. But that's all it's saying. Uh, if there's anything in urllive.request in the global space, it's going to run. So just be cautious. Um, packages. You can import a package. So you can import sound or you can import game. game. Sound is part of a game. Graphics is part of a game. So a package is a series of modules. YAML is actually a package. So when I look here and I look at site packages, these are all packages. Okay, YAML is a package. And in that package, I have different, I have the composer, I have the constructor. So I can import, you know, from YAML import composer. I can do that and it will only import the composer module. So YAML is a package because it has a lot of different scripts in it that I can do the import from. Um, Python has a standard library. There's a lot of stuff in the standard library. You can go out to docs.python.org. They cover all of this stuff really, really well. Um, and we've used some of it. We've used random. You know, we've used OS. We've used sys. Or have we used sys? We've used OS. OS. So um, it's always a good practice before you start writing brand new code to go out and see what is out there. Okay, what is out there provided by Python and what's out there provided by the open source community and if your company is open to it, potentially what's out there that you can buy. Um, if, you know, part of being efficient is knowing when to, you need, when you really do need to create your own code or when you need to go out and find something that's already available and existing. Numpy. This is just an example of a package. This is scientific and mathematical computations. We could as easily be talking about pie game here um, to write your own game. Um, and that's it. So do you have any questions? No problem. I should have this up tomorrow. I'll have uh, the pseudocode as well as the uh, scripts up sometime tomorrow on the YouTube site. No problem. Uh, good luck, Casey, and great job because this is the end of the term and you did wonderful. So have a good evening.